next shock and then reacting to it. We have to stand up proudly and boldly and fight for the people that we believe in. And in this case, it is the women of Texas. And lest anybody think that this is a pipe dream, or that this is impossible, or the odds are too stacked against us right now, remember that in 1972, abortion was also outlawed in the state of Texas. And no one came to our rescue. No one saved the day. There was no knight in shining armor. It was Texas women. It was Jane Roe of Roe versus Wade, but it was also her two attorneys, both Texas women, Sarah Weddington from Ameline, Linda Coffey, who still lives in Dallas. Those three women successfully argued the case before an all-male Supreme Court, and 49 years ago won that landmark decision that stood the test of nearly half a century in America. It was Texas women who won the day in 1973. It will be Texas women who win the day in 2000.
or man-gated items, and they get left at the bedside with no proper care. So how do you feel about humanizing nurses? Thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do. Um, you know, everyone at the beginning of the pandemic was thanking you, and we're so grateful for you. And yet, two years after that pandemic began, you're still there, and the job is no less uh, easy, no, or no less difficult, no less dangerous. And yet, very often, because of the nursing shortage that we have, you get the frustration and the anxiety and the ire of so many of these people who come in and are wondering, why is it taking you so long to be able to see a doctor or a nurse or a medical provider? So I think you just need to hear it from me and all of us. You are our hero. You've got your back. We're going to do what we can. We are in Texas, 20,000 nurses short today. So a nurse to patient ratio that in some clinical settings was one to four, is now one to six, is now one to eight, is even worse in some places, causing many nurses to leave those jobs and become travel nurses, and to make sometimes two or three times what they were making back in Victoria or in El Paso, Texas, no longer in these communities. So what are we gonna do about it? One, to meet that shortage, I mentioned this about doctors and medical specialists in places like Del Rio. We need to extend this to nurses as well. If you come from a community that is underserved and your profession is in demand and we otherwise can't get you there, why don't we pay the cost of your nursing school education? If you've already taken on debt and are struggling to pay it back, why don't we wipe that clean so you have every reason to come back to Victoria and practice medicine here and be there for your patients. Let's also hire more nurse educators. We've got a constriction in the pipeline right there at Bobbitt. Let's make sure that it's easier for more nurses to get into the profession. And the last thing that you ask, right now Texas is a so-called right to work state, which means it's very hard for workers in any organization to be able to organize, to use their combined value to get better wages, better working conditions, a safer workplace. Let's change right to work to right to organize in the state of Texas. So that you and anyone else who wants to form our joint union is able to do that. Thank you. Thank you for forming the joint union. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. I might very well try to medicate myself in the only way 
that I know how and can afford. Lest we judge those who have this challenge right now, or even think about incarcerating them, when what they really need is help and treatment and recovery and rehabilitation. Let's make sure that we put our money where our values are. So, in addition to expanding the which will begin to fund the gap that we have in mental health care, let's also acknowledge that that will be insufficient to the task at hand. You can't bring in 10 billion a year every year and go from 51st to first, and that's where I want to be. We're going to need to make more state resources available to mental health care providers. And the woman asked about the $211 million that Greg Abbott took out of this state's mental health care budget the month before Givaldi. The month before he got on that stage, the day after that massacre, and said, this is a mental health care issue in Texas, and we should do something about it. Well, not only did he take us all the way down to 51st, he took whatever meager amount of money we had, and 211 million was empty for something God only knows what, because it pales in comparison to the need that we have here in this community, or the need that they have in theirs. Let's make sure, I mentioned the, the most vulnerable among us. I was talking about kids in the foster care program. I was talking about children with intellectual and medical complexities and disabilities that need our attention and help. They're gonna live independently and be able to live to their full potential. But I'm also talking about people who need mental health care in the state of Texas. Think about this, because those to whom we propose this after we win this, they'll say, Beto, you already expanded Medicaid, because we'll win that. And now you're asking us for more to fully fund mental health care and try to get us first in the nation. That's gonna be really expensive. And what we need to say is, right now in the county jail system, is the largest provider of mental health care services. You and I, as taxpayers in this county, pay 120 bucks a night to keep someone locked up who has schizophrenia, or bipolar disorder, or clinical depression, who for a fraction of that, we could give consistent preventative care so they're healthy enough and well enough to raise their kids, go to work, start a business, finish their education, run for the lives, whatever they're doing what they're trying to do. So yes, I support you, I'll have you back. I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Hello, Beto. Hi, Beto. Uh, in your opening comments, uh, you said some things that were very important. Uh, you talked about the civil rights movement. You mentioned John Lewis, the gentleman from, uh, from your council. Dr. Lawrence Nixon. Dr. Nixon. And uh, earlier uh, this year, or last year, 21, Greg Allen signed a bill in the law that uh, prohibits the teaching of like, uh, critical race theory. And, and, and inside that bill, you cannot teach kids anything about the civil rights movement, which means uh, you can't say, I, I have a free speech. You can't say things like that. And I think we're better than that as a people. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thanks for the question. <laughs> you know, I grew up in El Paso where Dr. Lawrence Nixon not only led that fight to integrate voting in the state of Texas, but founded the first chapter of the NAACP in the entire state in 1914 in my hometown. Never heard his name growing up. Never knew his story. This is one of the most consequential figures in American history because not only did he do those two things, he really laid the groundwork for those who would follow him, including LBJ, signing the Voting Rights Act into law in 1965. Imagine now being prohibited by law from saying that guy's name, or telling his story, or helping the kids of this state be proud of that guy who fought not just for himself, but for those very kids in these classrooms today. Or Thelma White, another El Paso. And I guess this is my prerogative, because I've got the mic to, to brag on my hometown. She graduates from Douglas High School, Valedictorian in 1954. Douglas High School, of course, the only high school she could attend because she still lived in the segregated South in Texas. Has the audacity to apply for admission at Texas Western College, now called the University of Texas at El Paso, and is denied entry solely based on the color of her skin. Remember, she graduated valedictorian. She, like Nixon, takes her case to the federal courts with the help of a little known attorney named Thurgood Marshall, they win a decision that not only integrates higher education in El Paso, 
it opened up the doors of public higher education throughout the state of Texas. This extraordinary woman, at least she was a girl at the time, who had amazing courage. I mean, this is the Jim Crow South that she was fighting in. She risked not only in dignity and humiliation and rejection, really she risked her life by doing this. And not to tell her story in our classrooms, in our schools, who are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? We're bigger than that stuff. Let's make sure that parents and teachers and the community comes together to tell the whole true story and history of the state of Texas. Thank you for the question. Hi there. I'm sorry. Hi there. Um, my name is A.J. Yuri, and I'm from Portland, Texas. And I'm a little bit of a gun rights type person, so I'm asking you how you're going to thread the needle to make sure we still have rights and but yet take care of them. Great, thank you for being here. Um, and I love Portland. We uh, did an event, maybe you can tell just a little bit. We did an event in uh, Corpus Christi at the beginning of this campaign, and then went over to Portland and had a meeting with some folks. Amazing community, ran there in the morning, absolutely beautiful. Questions about the Second Amendment? Um, again, just to bring everyone on the same page, I know you know this, but it bears repeating. There is no right that is protected in our Constitution that is unlimited in its scope, right? Uh, the First Amendment, you all heard this a million times, it protects freedom of speech, but it does not protect your ability to yell fire in a crowded movie theater if there is no fire because you risk having everybody stand up, make a rush for the exits, trample each other, people might get injured or even die in the process. The Second Amendment, this, this right to bear arms, uh, that begins uh, with the description of a well-regulated militia, that is also not unbounded. There are restrictions within the Second Amendment. And I'll give you a few. Um, there's a reason that you don't see anybody walking around with a grenade launcher. Uh, or uh, an anti-missile system, or riding a tank down the streets. Those sound ridiculous, right? That's what no one would ever want to do that, even if we could do that. But no one has an automatic machine gun in this state, or very few people do. It's not illegal, hasn't been outlawed, but in 1934, this country decided that it was sick and tired of seeing people shot up with these fully automatic machine guns, these weapons of war, and they made it prohibitive for just about any American to own one. Now tell me the last time you've heard or read about or watched on broadcast television a story of a bunch of kids or a bunch of people or a bunch of anyone in the state of Texas or in this country shot up with a fully automatic machine gun. You have it because it has not happened in decades. Some may ask, well listen, if you come up with laws that regulate our ability to own firearms, you know, the law-abiding citizens will follow them the criminals will not, so don't even begin to try. That shooter in Uvalde, the 18-year-old who bought not one with two AR-15s and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, he followed the law. He didn't try to get that AR-15 when he was 15 or 16 or 17. He patiently waited until his 18th birthday to buy those two firearms and those hundreds of rounds of ammunition. I mentioned earlier a proposal to raise the minimum age of purchase for an AR-15 or an AK-47 to 21. If we had that on the books, which by the way, the entire city council, including the mayor of Uvalde, all agree with, and he and I don't see eye to eye on everything, but we agree on this much. We would have purchased three more years for a stroke of luck or an intervention or maybe access to mental health care if mental health care was even the problem to begin with. A universal background check? You may say, look, that's why I went to a gun store the other day. I had to go through a background check. We have them in Texas. We don't have universal background checks, which means that in 2019, when a guy walked into a, a gun dealer, tried to buy an AR-15, and was rejected because he couldn't pass the background check, he was able to go buy from a private seller the very same AR-15, no questions asked, and turn around and use it on the people in that community, killing eight in the process. A red flag law? I think there are legitimate concerns about a red flag law, just to make sure that you know that I'm listening to you. We want to make sure that this is not a frivolous attempt to deny somebody of a constitutionally protected right. But, at the same time, if someone who owns a firearm is saying, you know what, I'm going to 
gonna shoot myself. Or you know what, I'm gonna take this gun into school and shoot people there. Or you know what, I'm gonna shoot my girlfriend or my wife. We've gotta take that seriously. In 2019, after listening to Donald Trump talk about invasions and animals and infestations, Greg Abbott saying, Texans, you must defend yourselves and take matters in your own hands. This young man in Allen, Texas, buys an AK-47, drives into El Paso, goes into a Walmart, right after posting a manifesto saying that he's come to repel that invasion he's heard about. He's coming to repel the invasion of Hispanics in the state of Texas. Kills 23 people in a matter of minutes. In my hometown of El Paso, in most years, 20 people are not murdered the entire year. It's one of the safest cities in the United States of America. Well, that guy, when he orders that AK-47, his mom calls the police in Allen, Texas. She says, I have no idea what my son needs with this AK-47. And she may have expressed some other signs of distress, but no red flag laws on the book. The Allen Police Department said, we're sorry, ma'am. Good luck. You're on your own. That Uvalde shooter I mentioned earlier, he was sending so many signals off that he was in trouble that his friends called him the school shooter before he ever walked into that school and shot him. Don't you wish, because I know that the parents in Uvalde wish that we had some way to intervene before it's too late. Look, this issue is one that all of us in Texas care deeply about. And I will never try to persuade you to, to change your mind or to feel somehow differently than you do the way you do today. But we have got to find some common ground to be able to do better. Because the alternative is consigning our kids and the generations that follow to this fate, to this fortune, to this future. And as the father of three kids who just started the school year Monday in El Paso, sophomore, freshman, and sixth grader. I'm gonna be accountable to them and their judgment, and I will not fail. So I say, look, we may not all get what we want out of this debate, out of this conversation, and at the conclusion of it, but if we're willing to seek the common ground, if we seek consensus, if we're even willing, and I know this is a four-letter word in American politics, if we're even willing to compromise, we'll be able to defend the Second Amendment and better protect the rights of our fellow Texans to stay alive, especially the kids in those classrooms. That's how I see the second amendment. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Shouldn't have that firearm 
to begin with. You know what, today, more cops have been gunned down in the state of Texas than any other state in this nation. We've seen a predictable escalation in gun violence. The Vietnam veteran who called me to tell me he was upset about my position on AR-15s and AK-47s said he's even more upset about permitless carry because he is a firearms trainer. And he said in the LTC program that we used to have, Beto, I would take people in who had to get this training, who didn't know which end of the gun the bullet came out of. I'm worried that they're now out on the streets, as are the 38,000 people who have those licenses to carry denied, and the tens of thousands more who knew better than to ever apply for a license to carry in the state of Texas, because they never would have passed the background check. They're all out there, and we're none the wiser, and we're none the safer for it. So this question, you know, whether you live on a ranch, whether you live in an apartment, um, I want you to be able to have that fire. I want you to be able to use it for self-defense. Uh, you may just collect them. You may use them for sport. You may use them to hunt. That's really none of my business. It's none of anybody's business but yours. But we have to do this responsibly. So in addition to some of those other proposals that I made earlier, I just commit to you that I'm going to listen to law enforcement. We are going to try to repeal that permitless carry rule. We'll get back to a license to carry program in the state. So we get back to the responsible tradition of gun ownership in the state of Texas. And we're going to this Thank you. So this is going to be our last question. If we didn't get to you, we are going to stay afterwards and say hi and take a picture if you'd like. Hi, my name is Karina. Um, I've, I've lived in Victoria. Um, I was like six. I just recently graduated from one of our three high schools here. Um, I, I just want to highlight my experience and how you can change the kids that are after me um, and help them enjoy their experience maybe a little bit more than I did. Um, after COVID, there was kind of a shift in the school system. I think we all kind of felt it as students. Um, you could walk through the hallway and you can kind of just see like their faces and the exhaustion that's really just going on on not only the students, but the teachers as well. And I kind of just want to know how you would help the curriculum in Texas and the students and the teachers in Texas kind of feel like school is an okay place to be. It's not just a matter of laziness that kids don't want to be there. It truly is just a big weight on their shoulders and the teacher's shoulders and the administrator's shoulders and the janitors and the cafeteria ladies, everybody there. Um, I just want to know how you can make Texas schools a little bit more enjoyable for everyone involved. Great. Great question. Thank you for asking. You know, we were in uh, Laredo, Texas at the start of this year, and a, a sixth grade middle school teacher, uh, her name's Max Maxine, um, she said, you know, Beto, uh, the reason that I'm opposed to the STAR test, in addition to what I shared earlier about it, doesn't really effectively measure the things that are most important to us, right? But she said, I just want you to remember that we've just had two years of the pandemic, two years of learning loss, two years where these kids in these schools have lost their grandparents, in some cases to COVID, or their parents have lost their jobs, or their families have lost their homes, and they're going from one couch and one house to another night after night, she said, Beto, I am literally right now trying to keep these kids alive. She mentioned the level of suicidal ideation that we're seeing in our schools. And look, I hate to talk about that. I hate to think about that because I've got kids and I don't want to even imagine that. But it is happening right now. And if we fail to confront it, we fail to face it, we're not going to do anything in order to change it and to make it better. So, so lifting that burden of those high stakes, high pressure tests, where teachers spend not you know, a few minutes or a few hours or a few days, but weeks teaching their children how to take a test versus teaching their children the subject matter that they are an expert in, that they have the experience in, instead of stoking their curiosity and let those kids loose to be able to pursue their dreams. That is so hard for those teachers. It is so hard for those kids. As the parent of kids who are going through that right now, it's hard on your entire family. And it can make it difficult to make that learning experience as enjoyable as you're describing right now. So, in addition to ending the STAR and replacing it with something like a, a diagnostic, it's like a point in time measurement, you don't prepare for it, you don't test for it, we just want to know how you're doing and how we get more resources to you instead of the STAR, which is, you know, how can we punish you or threaten you or scare you about whatever. Um, 
that's a great start. The next thing that I want to do is to make sure that we're working with someone at the top of the educational structure in Texas who really gets it. And that's why after we win this, after we work together to win this race, I'm going to appoint a classroom teacher as a TEA commissioner in the state of Texas. And lastly, lastly, evidence of what you're just describing right now is the fact that we're losing teachers by the thousands, right? I was just reading an article here in Victoria about the CFO of the Victoria Independent School District who's talking about how hard it is to hire up everyone. And the classroom teachers, the counselors, the librarians, but as you mentioned, the custodial staff, the school bus drivers, the administrators, everybody who makes public education possible. It's a real crisis. For my youngest in his fifth grade year, that he just completed in June, the entire academic year, he didn't have a single permanent classroom teacher. All he had was subs, and I love subs. They're amazing, but the permanent classroom teacher, the consistency of that person's presence with those kids, that's another thing that not only makes learning possible, but it's gonna elevate their attitudes and their moods and their enjoyment and their expectation of coming to school the next day. So I wanna sit down with you, with the teachers that you've had, with the local administrators in this school district and find out what we need to do as your partner in Austin to make sure that we have the best public schools on the planet right here. Yeah. Right? Victoria, Texas, thank you for coming.